change your mind about leaving, leaving me behind. Well, bring it to me, bring your sweet love, bring it on home to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know I laughed when you left. I only, only hurt myself. Bring it to me and your sweet love and bring it on home to me. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know I'll always be a slave till I'm buried. Buried in my grave. Oh, bring it to me. Bring your sweet love. And bring it on home to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hey, folks. Back from the first leg of the tour with a big, great success. A lot of fun. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Atlanta. Thank you, Nashville. Honestly, uh, really owned made us feel like we all owned ourselves by not going to the South sooner. It was uh, it was great. Uh, and on Saturday, be going to Texas for the second leg. Looking forward to that as well. Uh, but that gives me a chance right now to sneak in. One cheeky little chapter, a short little chapter, of Dawn of Everything before going back on tour. And then when we come back, hopefully we can have at least a couple weeks where we can keep going through. Yeah, that's why I got a haircut, so I could go on tour. I wanted to look respectable. Yeah, we're going to be in Austin for South by Southwest. This is very funny. Uh, never thought that uh, that was anything I would ever go to or be involved with. Uh, but there's also a bar show we're doing the next day as well. We're going to make sure to keep it weird. Not going to let anything unweird happen. Uh, I've been deputized by Greg Abbott to neutralize with extreme prejudice anyone who's not weird in Austin. Okay, so... I don't know how long we'll actually talk about this chapter today because it's pretty short. Uh, and I was thinking about maybe like, you know, adding the second one, another one with it. But the, the next chapter is actually relatively long. Uh, and also, you know, there's no, we've established a pattern here. So uh, I think next week when, the, which is a, a chapter, about, or the next, uh, when we get back from the tour again, uh, the next chapter is about early urban uh life in the first cities in the, in the world, uh, which were dominated, according to GrabGro, not by settled agriculture, but by, uh, by this mixed economy of foraging and uh, agriculture. And that's going to be interesting. But to set that up, chapter six here, which is called Ecology of Freedom, how farming first hopped, stumbled, and bluffed its way around the world. The purpose of this chapter is to set up uh, the conditions for the emergence of agriculture as, the, as a dominant uh, ecological or uh, economic paradigm. Uh, and they start off by pointing out that there are traditions of communal farming, systems that redistribute land, hold land in common, and involve a like politically enforced uh, egalitarianism that have persisted throughout the world uh, up to the present day, or up to the, mo or the modern era anyway. Uh, I mean, they got wiped out by capitalism like everything else, but... but 
the, the thing that this suggests to grab grow is that there is nothing that requires intensive agriculture to inevitably create private property regimes controlled by hierarchies. Because you have examples in places like uh, peasant Russia and, uh, and Indonesia, all over the place, of, uh, of farming communities that maintain uh, communal, if either communal land holding or a system where land is swapped between families to prevent that accumulation uh, by one family, one group, one clan over another. And that if that can happen, then, according to GrabGrow, it means that nothing about agriculture specifically, nothing about the putting of crops in the ground and making them grow, makes hierarchy happen, which is contra the traditional understanding of how so America, uh, human civilization emerged. So around 12,000 years ago, at the very end of the, once the, uh, the, the, the final ice age the glaciers receded, we get the uh, emergence of a moment that allows for uh, uh, sustained human uh, social structures supported by sustained agriculture. The Holocene, it's called. This is, a, this is an era when we finally get a stabilized, um, a, sta a stable uh, band, basically, of uh, weather that allows for, uh, allows humans to realistically and reasonably expect that if they pursue an agricultural project, that it will, in even the medium term, uh, be be sustained, you know, it's a stability. And as a result, you have this eruption of agriculture zones all over the world. Uh, they've actually got a cool little map here that I will show you guys. Look at this guy. You guys see that? Am I high, holding it up high enough now? Yeah, there. Uh, so all these spots, all these places on the map is where you see uh, agricultural societies start to emerge. People not just, you know, putting some crops in, in a littoral area, just, you know, and, and letting them be irrigated by uh, tides or something. We're talking about an intensive application of human energy into intensifying uh, intensifying uh, crop production by cereals and other and pulses and things like that, and also domesticating animals. It's a crucial thing. You can't really have one without the other. It is it is both uh, domesticating wild crops and domesticating wild animals that come together. And so, in all those areas and those maps uh, map I showed you. There's this explosion of, uh, of agricultural economies. Uh, and, and in all of them, they have different packages, basically, of, uh, of, of plants and animals that get domesticated. Uh, and the Fertile Crescent, you know, which is the place that we have the most documentation of, the place that we sort of give the most focus to when talking about uh, the rise of agricultural society, you had uh, in the West, wheat, barley, cattle, and pigs, uh, and in the East, barley, sheep, and goats. Uh, and, but, you know, in, 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 uh, in South America, you had, like, in the Andes, they were doing potatoes and, uh, and domesticating llamas. Uh, in they're doing pigs and, and yams and in New Guinea, you know, they're they're bringing into human control these different uh, crops and animals. So 
So what decides then where agriculture erupts and when why? Uh, and here, uh, Grabro actually uh, give a little bit of credit to, among others, Jared Diamond, who they ridicule earlier in the book and who has uh, a lot of, uh, you know, black marks on his record in terms of uh, his interpretation of evidence. I mean, he wrote a book about uh, the society collapse that has a completely radically incorrect uh, interpretation of the end of the Easter Island culture, for example, uh, and also uh, Iceland, for that matter, uh, or Greenland, rather. Uh, but one thing that he gets uh, stick from, stick for, I've seen people ridicule this online, is his famous north-south versus uh, east-west axis argument, uh, saying that only in Eurasia do you have this incredibly wide band of, of land where plants can essentially migrate via, you know, weather patterns from one place to another. And, and people point out the ridiculous of that because Africa is way, way wider. It, it doesn't look at that way because for, for, among other reasons, the danged Mercator projection. But Africa is huge and it's incredibly east-west. But what that ignores is that it's not just the question of whether you have an east-west access of travel, it's that there is a consistent um, climate along the axis. If you have a variety, if you have like a deserts and, and tropical zones uh, along an axis, th they uh, affect as barriers between transmission of these uh, resources. And unlike Africa or any other continent, Eur the Eurasian landmass has some, a band, an incredibly large east-west band that is all temperate. That's crucial. And that's why for, you see this, this rapid transmission of agriculture across the Eurasian steppe, or the Re Eurasian landmass. Um, and they get into, Grabgro get into the idea that, you know, uh, that European colonialism was a ecological colonialism. It was uh, the, pract the, the practice of taking uh, Eurasian-derived der uh, food ways and, and crops and animals and, and essentially Euroforming the rest of the world. And Grab Grow say, you know, that is accurate. You know, yeah, by the, by the time of the age of discovery, uh, quote unquote, you have uh, systems arrayed in such a way that, yeah, you know, the advanced technological societies uh, of Europe are going to be able to uh, dictate agriculture at the barrel of a gun. But what about, they ask earlier, like at the very beginning when, 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 uh, when people are deciding where they're going to, put down their roots and what they're going to do there. Why did uh, agriculture uh, be, uh, develop where it did? Because it did not become universal. This is a key thing that they want to point out. Like that map I showed you, it is not a map of this relentless uh, uh, spread. It's these specific zones within greater areas. And in the rest of those areas, you just do not see evidence of agricultural lifestyles. Um, and what Grabgro, I think, are mostly hypothesizing, but I think is is persuasive, at least as, uh, from a from a superficial reading, is that uh, the places that saw the emergence of agriculture are the places of most marginal uh, productivity. Like, like um, all of the most densely caloric environments are taken by foragers, by, by these fusion hunter-gatherer societies uh, that create the surprisingly robust and, and complicated social orders that Grabgrove uh, listed through the earlier chapters. Uh, 
and of course, you know, it makes sense. What, that, what, and if you're in a place that's that calorically dense, why the fuck would you start farming? If you can throw a, throw a net out and come back with enough fish for a, uh, for a winter, if you can uh, cure it, why the shit would you go through the ass pain of fucking agriculture? Like, that's the... That is, once you get uh, agricultural civilization up and running, and, you know, we'll talk with the rest of this book about where grave growth think that, thinks that actually comes from, because we still haven't gotten there. <laughs> um, once it's established, as I've said on this uh, stream before, the social superstructure where we all spend our time engaging with each other ritually and, uh, and symbolically becomes a, uh, a f zone of struggle to avoid having to fucking farm. Because it sucks. And so, of course, in, in, the, in, in the places in, uh, specifically in coastal areas, where you have a bunch of uh, easily accessible, uh, you know, tree fruits, shits that you can just pull off of uh, things that grow naturally, and a bunch of animals that you can, you can uh, hunt or fish, there's no incentive, there's nothing to make you farm. The places that saw farming emerge uh, are places where there's less ready calories, where the effort of intensifying uh, the agriculture is sort of necessary to sustain any kind of, uh, you know, stable uh, relationship with the environment. Now, one thing that I don't really talk about in this chapter, and which I'm kind of intrigued by, is where do these groups come from? Like, what distinguishes the people who stay by the water to the people who go and, and try to dig into the dirt inland? I mean, are they people who break off? Uh, are they people who... Uh, struggled for that area and were defeated? I mean, I don't know. They don't really get into that, and I'm kind of interested in, in, in how the land picks the people that end up uh, adapting it. Like, who is called to the soil? And, and it's, it's large, I mean, as we're saying here, uh, it's necessary, right? But, like, why can't you make it work in the uh, with the people by the water? You know, if you really wanted to, I think you could make it work with the people on the water. Why couldn't they make it work? Why couldn't they squash the necessary beef? Why was the conflict so persistent that they're like, all right, you know what? Fuck you. We're going to go sweat in the fucking sun all day to avoid having to be near you people. But anyway... So you see, uh, around 5,000 BC, the emergence of these uh, clusters of agricultural production and agricultural communities being built across the world. And there's an, it, the most interesting uh, sort of anomaly amongst these is uh, a, a, a bunch of linear pottery built makers uh, in Central Europe uh, that emerged around 5,500 BC and created, uh, you know, earth protect ditch protected uh uh settlements with uh like mud houses and were growing uh cereals uh and against the idea that once agricultural once agriculture takes root it becomes an unstoppable force rather than uh you know continuing to expand uh by 4500 this uh civilization uh, has a massive collapse which uh, involved at least, uh, who knows what went into it completely. Like, I'm, I'm, my guess is climate shifts probably had a lot to do with it. But <clears throat> one thing that definitely had something to do with it was violent conflict with neighbors. Because in these settlements, uh, there are tons of bodies that have been uh, s brutalized, stabbed, uh, decapitated, uh, evidence of uh, some sort of uh, uh, 
conflict and then uh, decimation, like uh, like the fucking Trojan War. Which, uh, and and interestingly, one of the pieces of evidence uh, that kind of can be put in next to this, and and, and at least creates a uh, a narrative, even if you can't really prove it is an uh, interesting phenomenon of uh, the fact that among these uh, mass graves, you don't see a lot of young women, and that among uh, remains found of coastal European hunter-gatherer settlements, you find uh, younger women with uh, anomalous um, uh, diets. Because one of the big breakthroughs in, in... I guess what? What do you call it? It's not archaeology. I don't know. The study of old shit uh, has been the ability to uh, use... What the hell's the name of it? I forgot the name of the pro- the process, but it's a process whereby you can uh, uh, determine from, I think, like, isotopes, whatever the shit, uh, like, what's in the diet of, like, uh, a, a skeleton you find. It's not radiocarbon dating. That's not it. It's something else. Carbon dating, that's for dates. This is literally for, um, for like, what's in the body, what has been metabolized by the body, and then, like, isotope. It's an isotope. There's isotopes in there somewhere. Anyway, these uh, young women we find in these coastal areas don't have uh, a lot of fish in their diets, they've got uh, they've got meat. They've got red meat. What's the deal? Perhaps they get carried away. Did they get fucking owned? And then all the young women got carried away. Who knows? But one way or the other, this is a early agricultural development that did not lead to any kind of uh, sustained growth. At the same time, around the same time this is happening, you see much more successful uh, agricultural experiments in uh, the Nile Delta and in the Lapita horizon of uh, Oceania, uh, going up to but not going to across, going basically down through Oceania uh, to Papua New Guinea, but not not getting to Australia. And also, so so these are the Oceanians, the Egyptians, uh, the Central Europeans. Some successful, some less successfully. Over time, are building like real, sustained uh, agricultural societies where the diets depend on the surpluses produced by agriculture, where they fully domesticate uh, wild crops and animals. But at the same time, this is happening. There is also agriculture in Amazonia, which is doing that balancing act that Grab Grow liked to uh, emphasize was wholly within the capabilities of early humans of taking from agriculture that which is uh, uh, culturally useful really more than anything while maintaining uh, the uh, flexibility and, and the sort of enforced egalitarianism of the, for- the foraging social order. Uh, like, for example, they didn't domesticate any animals, but they did have a ton of pets who were essentially tamed uh, jungle creatures. And they would travel while uh, foraging with these this fucking menagerie of uh, jum- jungle creatures who were all essentially uh, parts of the tribe. So that's a sort of liminal liminal zone between, you know, pure hunter-gathering and, and the, domest- the process of domestication. Because the goal there, the self- according to grab grow, the self-conscious goal of the social order is to prevent any kind of um, accumulation of disharmony uh, caused by the particular pathologies of a given uh, form of agricultural produ- or ec- uh, economic production and 
uh, shifting between the between them. So wrapping up the chapter, Grab Grow want to just make several uh, sort of culminating statements about this transition to agriculture before we get to the second half of the book, which I think is going to focus uh, more and more on the emergence of uh, all the icky regimes of hierarchy that they don't like and that, you know, nobody really likes. Uh, at least nobody who's reading the book, probably. Um, but which, according to them, uh, were not required to make the uh, transition to... Uh, they were Their shift towards hierarchy was not commanded by uh, their uh, embrace of agriculture. So... To wrap it up, they say that farming emerges as, a, as an act of necessity uh, to get more calories out of a land that doesn't have as much easy access to calories as you get in other areas. Uh, and so as a result, it's a less, in the early stages, like the early human uh, social, like during early humanity, prehistoric uh, humanity, Looking back, we make more out of farming. We assume it was more influential and more dominant in the world among the humans who existed because uh, it has more remains, because uh, settled agricultural communities uh, built out of more durable materials, left more refuse, piled up more crap in one place, and are therefore easier to study. And so we're able to look at early humanity and just see where farming emerged. Grab grows are arguing that while that's happening, yes, it's happening in marginal zones. It, it, where the most people are, where, where human civilization is most complex and where it's thriving, uh, are people who are still uh, hunter-gatherers and foragers, uh, but, and who do, but are not going to leave the, the, the trace remnants that the, the agriculturalists will. And so... The centrality of agriculture to uh, early human social forms, in which, as Grab Grow point out, uh, are egalitarian and hierarchical, all at the same time. Uh, there's there's hierarchy among for, uh, foragers. There's egalitarianism among farmers. There's no nothing. Uh, determined between these relationships. But we look backward and tell a story that central centers farming because that's uh, what's left the, the record. Uh, in a similar way, we look at hunter-gatherer societies through the lens of the present remnant of hunter-gatherer social orders, which we take to be uh, the dominant model, even though by definition, these are also now uh, dominating only in the most marginal environments. Like it's been inverted over time. In the very beginning of humanity, hunter gatherers stayed where the resources were, stayed where the calories were. And those other people, the losers, had to end up going out in the woods and finding some way to eat living out of uh, the dirt. But eventually, hierarchy and, and technology and uh, got fused to agriculture and its uh, increased ability to uh, heart, to create surplus and distribute surplus allowed it to uh, completely overwhelm and, and uh, destroy hunter-gatherer society uh, except where things are so remote that there's nobody interested in it. And so we look through, so we have this perfectly uh, reversed understanding of early human social civilization. Uh, and in both cases, it's a product of the limited, the limitations of our evidence. 
and our failure to take into account uh, the dark matter. We look back at the uh, archaeological leavings of humanity in the early era, and we only see the uh, we see much more of the uh, leavings of a agricultural social uh, order that was marginal, and now we see the most marginalized uh, social order uh, on Earth is hunter-gatherer societies, which are basically kept as like museum, living museum exhibits, or are just destroyed if somebody does decide that the land that they have is worth anything. And we see how they are organized through the lens of, uh, of their uh, precarity. But precarity is not the defining characteristic of a hunter-gatherer social order. It is only a uh, historically associated one now with this time frame, with this fixed uh, historical era. That's that, that scarcity, which informs so much of contemporary hunter-gatherer societies, uh, could hypothetic would, would be different in a uh, system or in a, in a time when there are barely any humans on Earth relative to how many are on Earth now, uh, and way more plants and animals. So to get at the, so the next chapter is going to be about cities and it's a big long one. So I'm excited. Hopefully we can get into something uh, juicy. This was really felt like more of a throat clearing chapter. So the next ca chapter, chapter eight is imaginary cities, Eurasia's first urbanites in Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, Ukraine and China and how they built cities without kings. So here's where uh, Grab Grow, I think, are going to also uh, argue that in addition to agriculture not de determining uh, a hierarchical social relationship, urban life also does not uh, imply a hierarchical relationship necessarily. Uh, I, I'm... I think this is when we're going to start having some real sparks fly between us, so looking forward to it. And I will, unfortunately, though, it'll be a couple weeks because going back on tour, very excited about that. I'm going to take the take the George H.W. Bush tour of Texas and then go to uh, New Orleans, where I'm hoping to be beaten to death for my Clay Higgins impression. So yeah, that's it for today. I mean, this is a short one, so uh, maybe I'll take some questions, finish it up. Somebody says uh, that uh, it was steppe nomads who wiped out all these uh, settled peoples, which doesn't that uh, validate the Kurgan thesis that they talked about in an earlier chapter, which I didn't say it at the time. I wish I had uh, is something that uh, I think is pretty cool is that the bad guy in the Highlander movie uh, is called the Kurgan. Like he's like the Ur warrior. I mean, I guess it makes sense, you know, if, if you're out in the steppe, uh, I think scarcity more than anything has to do with the uh, creation of hierarchies and, and of uh, like violent social orders. I think it's when you have a situation where you have people who need to live 
uh, and the environment keeps telling them, no, you can't, that uh, everything gets thrown out, you know, like it, when, you're, uh, when your hot air balloon is sinking and you got to throw things off, uh, all of our uh, social rituals that maintain social comedy, that maintain the, the easiest way of living, the easiest way of living is one when you're not afraid of anybody. That's the easiest way to live. That's the best way to live. That is the, that's the heaven. Heaven is not being afraid of anybody. And I do think that there was a strong current in human, civil, uh, human uh, development that pushed towards that and resisted encroaching hierarchies. Because as soon as you create hierarchies and as soon as you have the commanders and the commanded, all of a sudden you have this, this fracture and that fracture creates anxiety, alienation, uh, uh, fear, resentment. What is? What are they going to do to me? And of course, you know, it's one thing if you're afraid of your enemy, if you're afraid of a of a, of a different tribe, a different group. Uh, but to be afraid, to be afraid of your your people inside the the tents, inside uh, the the ditch. That is a social poison. And nobody would choose, I don't really don't think anyone would choose to bring that into a social dynamic. And this is why I disagree with Grabgro on their idea that there was no, no inherently egalitarian uh, super early humanity like 100,000 years ago. No, I think that there was, um, I don't think that you could have human social order take root. I don't think you could have like tribal structures even emerge without a, a uh, commitment in their forging to egalitarianism. But necessity is the ultimate arbiter. Society, all the culture stuff, and all, all of the civic rituals that make us think that we're free and that, and that relieve the alienation of living in a society, living in society, Like all that stuff is, uh, at the end of the day, a luxury. It's a luxury that is brought about by, hey, we don't have to, you know, keep running. We don't have, there's no saber-toothed tiger at our heels. We can rest. So what should we do with our time of rest? And everything comes out of that. And the expansiveness of our civic life depends on just how blanketed we are, how protected we are, how large the buffer is between our luxurious ritualized social interactions and necessity. And that's why liberalism does, turns into fascism. Because liberalism is a luxury. And when necessity shall, comes to call in, all the liberal stuff gets thrown off of the fucking bow. Leaving only just the hard carapace itself. Because what liberalism is, is a civic, uh, ritualized, religious reversal. Um, revers <clears throat> reversal of uh, our basic like ethical notions. It literally says bad is good and good is bad. But in such a way that people can live within it and be fully convinced that their idea of the good, which is, I would argue, for most people, a good faith engagement with notions of virtue. Like, I think, like, transcendent concepts of, of, of uh, you know, doing unto others, all that. Because, as I said, it's the ideal state. It is what we rationally want. Liberalism says that's impossible. And so, therefore, on top of our real, good faith, best, uh, best effort ideas of doing what's right, 
have to go out into the world and do what's wrong. We have to do wrong to do right because we can't live that way. There's something broken in us, whatever it is. We can't live that way. We can only negotiate through this marketplace. But the marketplace in, in an ascendant liberalism has so many bells and whistles and gigaws and gimcracks and so many channels to allow for a, a public ritualized redistribution of resources, a enactment of a sort of uh, kabuki justice that we can believe in it. And most of us do believe in it. But it requires surplus and it requires stability in the input uh, of the economy. And when fascism uh, or when those inputs break down, there's nothing left but the machinery of exploitation. And uh, the filter that turns bad into good is removed. And so the only people who will wield power, who will choose to seek power, are those who are self-consciously bad, <laughs> have have fused their idea uh, of virtue to the machine. And however, whatever uh, costume that has, it's, it's, the nihil, it's the final nihilistic destruction of humanity. Like the, 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 the sufferers, they will be destroyed physically. People at the bottom half of the dispersal when crisis hits, cap, hits liberal capitalism. The bottom half and the scapegoats, those two groups, like it's the yin and yang. You got the bottom half and then you got the scapegoats. So the, the bottom half of the, of like in terms of income uh, and resources, plus those in the top half who can be chosen as scapegoats. They will be physically destroyed. And then the winners will be spiritually destroyed. Because carrying out that process, carrying out that elimination, will squeeze the humanity out of them like fucking toothpaste. Which is why fascism is a death drive. Because it cannot... It cannot uh, lead to a stabilized identity because you cannot live as a society, as a social organ with like all types of human beings with the human instinct towards uh, uh, connection. The human, just like the feeling you get looking into another human being's eye, like the, the stuff that builds your consciousness and informs your understanding of the world around you. You cannot have a whole social body that fascism imagines, all able to deny or warp that uh, conception around like uh, the total war that fascism requires. It's not stable. It'll destroy itself. And so it must be destroyed externally. So it's just gonna run, it has to run into a wall. But here's the thing about this. What I'm describing here, a lot of people are like, ah, yes, this is, uh, this is what Trump is uh, threatening. This is the global fascist wave that we're talking about. And yes, it is, but it's also liberalism. I mean, it's also the, the last uh, gasp of liberalism because there is a liberal fascist vision with its own scapegoats and its own mechanisms for destruction of the of the other that can be embraced like so and and the only difference will be the targets who ends up at the bottom and who is the scapegoat uh, on the top and that's because there's no class based political formation to challenge that at the end of the day uh, nervous breakdown within the psyche of the global middle class which is what politics is
Like there is a there is a liberal technocracy that is going to leave to uh, machines and the uh, the technology of law the job of uh, wiping out the undesirables, basically. Like as you can see with uh, Democrats and Republicans switching power. And nothing changing about the, the, the situation with the border, no matter how much people yell about it. It's just a question of, do you want those border areas to be theatrically and violently imposed? Like uh, uh, helicopter gunships strafing refugees, drone bombings that like it's, uh, go on a uh, live leak? Or do you just want to put up the fucking fence and, and let the machines handle it and ignore it. It's, it's a question of where are you going to put your energy into as a spectator rooting for this, or one or the other of it. Somebody said that the technology talk scares them more than climate change. I don't think you can extricate those two things. Because climate change would not be so terrifying if we had any faith that we could intervene collectively. And the reason we can't is not because of uh, fell human nature. It's because of technology. It's because we have alienated too much of the job of governing ourselves to technology which is organized around a central algorithm of profit extraction, which is the only real thing in the system. That's the real God. Profit extraction is the, uh, the split atom of like God's consciousness. Like it is, it is the motive force. It's the engine. It's the first mover of a global techno technological uh, governing system that has no human inputs. We have the technology to, just as we have the technology to cause the climate to almost to fucking go into overdrive, we have the technology formally to reverse that. But people say that all the time, and it's true. But it ignores the fact that part of the impact, part of the implication of having that much technology, is that you have given up the same amount of governance over that technology for it to be that powerful. There are two elements. There is the there is technological capacity, and then there is human human agency within it. And as one rises, the other declines. As technology gets more uh, more developed, human imp impact on it becomes less so. And that is why the hope we have for human flourishing is that the machine breaks down. There was once hope, the Marxist vision, was that the machine's controls could be grasped. And there was a mighty effort to grasp them that consumed the 20th century. But it was a lost cause. Skynet has won. But that's not doom-pilled nihilism because the conditions of their victory are the terminal destabilization of the system that their technology depends on. They're selling their own, the rope to fucking hang themselves. And, and what, what, what that breakdown means is up for us to determine. Like, I don't think this is a process that like, we need to await. It's clearly a process that is happening now. The only question is how long can it continue in the, in the face of no resistance? That's the thing, is that right now we are not a factor as humanity in the conditions of this collapse which means it might take a while. 
might take a goddamn long time. Like, I do have a, of a real vision of a, of, a, of a future where everything is as it is, except worse and, uh, and uh, in fewer geographic areas. Our, uh, the creation of a global archipelago of, uh, of, of uh, 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 like a supply chain archipelago. I mean, you could argue that that's already what we have. There are big chunks of the world that are outside of, of that, uh, that eye, and that's only going to get bigger. Uh, and then within, it's only going to get more hysterical and shrill. And the need to find scapegoats within the wire is going to become more uh, intense. And that could go on until humanity just winks out. But at every point along that continuum, which we're on, the process is ongoing, we all have to live. And in, a, in living, we can make decisions. We, de we can. Our very ignorance is what gives us free will. We very well, I, I think we are in a billboard universe where all of our actions are fully determined, but we can't know by what. And it's in our ignorance that we actually can assert independence. And that's faith, not faith in God as a, uh, uh, as a social symbol, but faith in the existence of the human. Like the idea that you're a human and that others, the other people you see are humans. And that doesn't require any kind of uh, like sappiness or... or like lobotomizing yourself. Oh, you believing in humans? Look at humans. They're epic fail. Absolutely humans are epic fail. But what about you? You have an idea of what's good. You have an idea of how things could and should be. They are, a, they have certain values attached to them that you can uh, like put your mind around and carry with you. Don't you have to assume that everybody else is too? So it doesn't require any any grand leap. It just requires assuming, really believing that you're real. Because the process of of uh, like the idea of the the the, we, the 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 winnowing of the human spirit that that technology has accelerated us through over time uh, is a process of dis of disenchantment. We go from from experiencing ourselves and the world around us as equivalently real. The world is as real as we are. And we and it's like that isn't something that we have to interrogate or or or, or run through some sort of logical calculus. It is the it is the evidence of our eyes. It is our empirical reality. Our empirical reality is that we are together because there are no abstract concepts to crowd out the space of pure like uh, connection. And then over time, as surplus accumulates, we begin to become disenchanted with the rest of the world around us. But that uh, understanding of the world doesn't go away. That, that degree of uh, like motor response to the world around us that we could only feel if we really felt that what was real was what was around us was happening that we are real it just gets internalized we go from thinking that we in the world are as real we go for i'm more real than the world but i am as real as the people around me to i am more real 
than the people around me. Because it's only when you think you're more real than someone else than you could really harm them. You could actually like dominate them because if you're both as real as each other, then the distinction is illusory and violence inflicted will only come back on you. The rational thing, if you know everything is real, is to not be violent. This is the this is the idea, this is the, in my mind, my, my basic premise for uh, the, the, the human, uh, human nature is that you will act in the world in relationship to your uh, degree of faith in the world, in its reality. I know that sounds circular, but it's important to emphasize that we don't think the rest of the world is real. Like, why the hell do we, have we all decided, in, after abandoning Christianity, that we're going to talk about it being a sim, the world being a simulation? Even though it's the exact same theological structure, it's the same idea, it's just one where we have replaced a God that signifies unity with a, uh, a technological demi-urge that signifies separation. Now, the hope of communism, the hope of, of, of the world spirit, is that the technology that we would all start using to commit violence against each other as we started to lose belief in one another, uh, which, as I'm saying, comes out of scarcity, comes out of conditions of disequilibrium that require necessary actions that impose a harsh hierarchy and violence that the social order do doesn't normally have. It's like an antioxidant just banging into your, your little social corpuscle. Eventually it's going to knock its uh, DNA out of place. It's cancer. So we've gotten all the way to the point where the only thing that is real is us. But the good news is that if the only thing that's real is us, then that means that the world is as real as we are. Boom. And that means every person is as real as we are. And the way we feel, the centrality, that, that godliness, they feel too. Boom. Boop. Zip. Click. It's on the table. Now, there's going to be a lot of incentive for people not to pick it up because a lot of them are too in, resentful and in pain uh, or because they're uh, too comfortable, too addicted to the pleasures of, 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 of being on the right side of the machine. Yes, I am balding. That is correct. I know it's a bummer. The dream of communism, the only dream worth having once capitalism becomes inevitable, which I don't think it had to be, but it was going to, I think it would have emerged eventually, given the conditions. Uh, but its proximate uh, explosion is a result of proximate conditions. Uh, the only hope is not to collapse back into uh, like pre-technological civilization because the cycle will continue. That's all history was, is a cycle of, this, of these ways of life uh, being built up, interacting with a change so, uh, uh, homeostasis that their intervention caused, and then their collapse. A dominance hierarchy is maintained by a surplus distribution that is maintained by a calorie extraction process that involves 
putting in X and bringing out Y from the soil. And the X factor in that is the environment. The X factor in that is the climate. And the thing about it is, thanks to the butterfly effect, intensive human intervention in uh, natural processes has a reflection. It, it causes a response, a reaction in uh, the natural uh, system. Homeostasis is, is disrupted. And then you get the, the distress call. It's, it's your biome telling you, hey, this doesn't work anymore. You can't do this. And the people at the top get this. They see the response. Oh, it's, it's failing. Oh, the, the, the crops are failing. Oh, boy. Uh, whoa, what's going wrong? Well, oh, you know what it is? We're pissing God off. But the God is the God of domination. The God is the Demiurge. The God is Satan. Always will be. Cast to be. Because it's a consecration of a, of a, of a sin, of, of the original sin. Of, 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 of socially consecrating a fundamental difference between human beings. So they change their social order and they do what they absolutely have to at the ground level to keep the thing going. But as things get worse, their first goal will always be to maintain the structure they're in, not to actually address the problem, which means they will always misanalyze it and then miss respond to it, which means they will only hasten the collapse and then the thing falls apart. That is every uh, era of human history since, since we started writing things down. That is every social order. The only difference between those times and this one, like that, that's, that cycle happening and, and, and that uh, interact uh, and that reflecting our um, current moment is that those were uh, geographically fixed locations within a greater homeostatic sphere, a globe, where other life systems were happening with different relationships to their environments, with different degrees of, 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 uh, of stability. And the, the, the general push was towards that, and these could be absorbed now we have the final totalization of capitalism over the whole globe, which is the totalization of a dominant structure carried out by technology. And we have, and, and we've reached the critical moment when the stuff we do to maintain the structure causes a disruption to the, uh, the na natural cycle that provides the inputs for our economy and provides the calories and the surplus that all this runs on. But because there, it is a dominance hierarchy that is unchallenged for power and has its hands firmly on all of the buttons, the few remaining areas of human uh, uh, autonomy that exist do so at the very top of this system. And those people are the most committed to its maintenance, and they always will be. Even if they individually had changes of heart, they would all be replaced. Now, I, I think that within every single previous cycle of, 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 of hegemonic imperial power rising and falling. You have the same thing. You have a social order that is an engine for surplus creation and exploitation, for the, for the allowance of some to pleasure at the expense of others, and then through social ritual inscribe that evil as a good. That is human civilization, broadly defined. And within it, there is a constant civil war within its middle class. The people who are not fully committed to it through the fact that they're unexploited at the top or fully enthralled to it by the fact that they are dominated 
at the bottom, but rather exist in the middle area, where their, their, uh, their exploitation within the system is also compensated for consciously with benefits from that system. Because the superstructure to, to the enslaved is clear. They all have, they are naturally equipped with the they live glasses. But in the middle is where the obfuscation occurs. And so politics is this middle class frantically trying to rearrange the order to accommodate crisis without recognizing the fundamental uh, driver of it because all of the culture that they interact with is designed to obscure it. But even within that, there are attempts where the scapegoats from one group, one, uh, one defeated middle class, will uh, hook up with the most active uh, and, and kinetic and, uh, and energetic members of the oppressed class and push against power to break it up. They have all are defeated. That's the, and then you get the common ruin after the defeat of the one by the other. And, you know, it's slave up. That's what it looks at like different things in different places. Uh, it looks like like slave uprisings in uh, ancient Rome, the servile wars. Uh, in the Middle Ages, you're talking about the millenary movements associated with uh, the return of Christ and the apocalypse and the need to uh, live in common that uh, you saw repeatedly. Culminating in, like, uh, I would say the, the, the climax of that movement is the uh, Anabaptists of Munster. And then under capitalism, it was uh, the labor movement, which is that alliance with the disaffected middle and the activist uh, bottom. Yeah, the Peasants' War is a good example of, of, of what that looks like under medieval feudalism. And eventually, what happened is, is that the most febrile of the middle class who went for the jugular. The disaffected uh, middle who joined the uh, who joined with the, the, the people of bottom were doing so out of a genuine commitment to values that transcended the personal, that understood humanity as collective. But that was an anchor because it inhibited their uh, the refinement of their movements. The middle class could move as a unit, as a class conscious movement, which it did in the mid 20th century. So when capitalism comes to shatter the, the, uh, the grounded, particularized, territorially designated power of earth and replace it with a global concept of, of domination, a world empire for the first time, who will dominate it? That was what the 19th and 20th centuries were about. Who will lay astride this machine? A coalition of the, of the uh, disaffected middle and the active south? Uh, or a <clears throat> fully self-committed uh, middle in alliance, of course, with the top? Because the top are going to be most connected, most, uh, most committed to the system. They might have outliers, but they'll just drift off and be hobbyists. They have no, there's, there's no way that they can uh, assert the market pressure, the market power that the organized top can. And so what emerged from that crisis of the mid-19th century, from the uh, revolutions of 1848 to uh, the, uh, the civil wars in there, but also uh, culminating really with the... Um, the Paris Commune, you see that battle be fought. And that is a fight between the top and the middle and the middle and the bottom. And when I say, I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying the most active of them. 
the most capable and the most pressed. And so that is why, over that period of struggle, the winner was fascism, which cloaked itself first in liberalism, as a as a as a sheep as a wolf would with sheep's sheepskin, and now as uh, as the crisis deepens and as necessity intervenes and interferes with our civic rituals and disabuses of disabuses us of our faith in their reality. It turns into fascism, which is why the first place to emerge with a fascist uh, drive for annihilation is in Europe after the Great War, which is the signal carnage, the, the, the mass uh, sacrifice necessary to enshrine the victory of the ruling of the middle and upper coalition. Because the victory of the Allies at the end of World War II is not the defeat of fascism, but the uh, taming of fascism to the ends of an Atlantic liberalism that was able to wield power behind a, 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 a veil of democracy due to its ability to access resources from people who don't count. We were able to... Ex uh, ex the, the West... The Anglosphere is able to expand by maintaining social harmony within. I mean, there's still social disharmony, but by alleviating it, by exploiting the labor and land of those who are outside the circle of belief, of, 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 of human brotherhood, uh, without, outside of the social circle. Germany couldn't do that. Germany was shit out of, shit out of luck. They were last tit. They were last piggy to the tit during the scramble for Africa. They got scraps. Which is why they fought World War I, and then when they lost it, that's why they were the ones who turned fascist. Because they were the ones who were economically dominated at the end of the war. They were the ones who could least, their systems could least handle the pressure of mass austerity that the West could, the farther West, the winners, I should say, of World War I. And the only way that they could hope to do what the Anglo spirit done after World War I is go East, Lebensraum. Go east, young man, and grow up with the country. But that meant doing to Europeans what had previously only been done to racialized others. And that is too destabilizing to the self-conceptions of Western capitalists. So they said no. And they allied with the, with the, with the commies. And I got to say, by that point, the Soviet Union under Stalin, I'm sorry, it's no longer a coalition of the uh, activist uh, workers and the most disaffected and most principled uh, middle. It is, it's the domination of a new bureaucratic middle. And they are... They operate foreign policy and they imagine themselves to be part of a democratic, like, uh, socialist project. They really believe that, but their understanding of it and definition of it is inextricable to their place within the structure of power. And that means that when they have to fight the outside world, when pressures increase, when the environment changes... They make the wrong decisions and they get owned. And they can't create and they can't maintain a social basis under pressure over time because there's nothing for anybody to believe in. Everybody gets mad at Khrushchev for his revisionism, but it was a recognition of reality. 
They had failed to transform the Soviet Union into like a revolutionary project, which meant it was just a country like other countries, and which meant it had to buy off its workers the same way that it bought them off in the West. What do you want? You want a TV? You want a, you want a fucking carbonated beverage? You want a vacation to the Black Sea? Here, just take it and shut the fuck up. That is the carrot that you have to give in lieu of a social project. So that means when the final, when the first real shocks come in the 80s, the final shocks, it can't handle it. It can't hold on and it collapses. Cuba survives because that distinction, I think, didn't really develop the same way. The, the activist working class were, uh, inter, uh, were integrated into systems of like party control at such a deep, at such a basic level that there is a way to be a working class that is exploited, oppressed, worker, a, like, spiritual, patriotic, metaphysical connection to the state project of Cuba. That's a thing that the exploited of our countries cannot imagine. The exploited in America, the bottom tier of America, just like at the West, most other places, has no allegiance to this project. They're alienated from it completely. That's not true in Cuba. That doesn't mean there aren't working class Cubans who are disaffected from the system. Absolutely. But again, we're talking about the most active, however you want to define that, uh, uh, socially, intellectually, the most febrile, you know, the most, the, the highest frequency uh, turners. There's a way to, to if you're a working class person, to work towards that goal and feel like you are doing something good, which we don't have. We can only feel like we're advancing the interests of somebody else for powers that we are feel oppressed by, and that just makes us feel loathing. It makes work suck. It makes life harder. And... I'm sorry, but the proof of the failure of the Soviet project is that by the 1980s, that's how the Soviet working class felt about their country, felt about their project. I don't think you can deny that. Because they would have not have let it fall otherwise. It was just this party machine this little encapsulated bubble, this bureaucratic strata trying to keep themselves afloat while the conditions collapsed underneath them and then finding no popular support. So they got torn apart by the outside forces of capital. And then the worst of that middle, the worst of that sector, the most, the people who were benefiting but didn't believe in it, the worst people are of course the ones who seize power as soon as it ends. And of course, we helped. You know, we helped rig the 96 election. Uh, so I said on the recent episode that we put Putin in. I don't mean that in the sense that we installed Putin the way that we like, the way that we did with like Mobutu in uh, Zaire. And just that we created the political conditions. We dictated the terms that essentially demanded that Putin be put in power. Once we destroyed the socialist project and replaced it with capitalism. The only person that was going to be able to dominate that condition, declining material conditions under capitalism, where there's no national project to be committed to, the only thing, the only thing that could control that uh, structure would be a crooked nationalist. That is the only person who could take power, the only people who could take power were people who were fully committed to be to their uh, their self interest, the truest capitalists.
And this is why China is so interesting, because I, I know that China, Chinese uh, culture is riven with contradictions, and there's huge alienation amongst its, uh, obviously amongst its still very poor rural population, and it's, uh, you know, it's alienated working class in the cities, and then it's anxious, downwardly mobile middle class in the cities as well. But there is also genuine belief in the fucking Chinese project. I don't know how deep it runs, but I think it is a mass base, which the West doesn't have. Just don't have it. And, and uh, what's silly about the reactionary project, the fascist project, it, what makes it the most pathetic cope possible is that you can imagine that kind of thing reemerging in America in the, in the symbols of uh, our extinguished, uh, exhausted liberal order. Like, you, you guys want to take the uh, symbols of liberalism that have been exhausted by their failure over, over time uh, and just rearrange them and, and hope that that can, like, re-enchant people to a system that just sees them more miserable every day? The, those things were forged by moments when things were going good. Those symbols were infused with meaning at times of ascendancy. Like, all those... The, like the, the, the tradition of Christian chivalry uh, of the medieval era that like neo-reactionaries fantasize about and that they embrace the, the symbols of and the, and the uh, social structures of, those are the fantasies that an ascendant feudalism was telling itself about itself. And the thing is, is that because it was ascendant, there was benefit to it. There was perceived benefit to it. And so it accrued, accrued to it faith. And then we carried them around as symbols as the conditions deteriorated. And then they lost their power. You have to, we have to create new symbols forged out of struggle where we feel like things are getting better, but not because of the whims of the market, which are only going to push down against us all but because we took discrete actions to infuse our alienated activity with meaning. Uh. So yeah, what fa the, the, the neo-fascists are the most uh, they're the most cap and cope people on earth. It is nothing but cap and cope from those people. They want to take the, the uh, they don't like, see, here's the thing. There is a uh, symbolic shape that is created by each social structure that it's uh, self-conscious, like ascendant middle should imagine itself to be, right? Like there is a form that we're all uh, supposed to view as aspirational. It's how we define ourselves. These are this is what an X is supposed to look like. And ruler, person in charge, person who deserves the benefits of a of uh, of a unequal social arrangement. The thing that makes it uh, right that they should have that is that they hold these positive characteristics. And that might be blood. It might be merit. But all it is, is it's a rationalization of power. So what the fascist does is he sees the, the machine coming in and he, he sees the imminence of like mass scale violence coming and he wants to array, brace himself for it in a way that will make him able to cope with it. And the best way to do that is to conceive of oneself as in alliance with the interests of the machine. But there's a contradiction. The image that the machine produces, the, co the, co the cookie cutter of what a good person who deserves good things is, 
is no longer compatible with uh, uh, decelerating uh, uh, material conditions. All the values that you're supposed to have, the package of liberal values you're supposed to have, and the culture that people with those values create, it's not one that can allow you to uh, do the violence that is going to be done. Because during the ascendancy of liberalism, you could, ba you could balance that appeal up with the real material advantage of being uh, a worker in the middle of the system in, in America and in, in, in Western Europe and, and in Korea and South Japan, wherever we were going to put enough capital to really build a robust social order, which is, of course, premised on extraction. We're extracting more and more from the environment in order to distribute more and more surplus to accommodate more and more exploitation. And since all the machine wants is to separate the good from the bad and to kill the bad and make the killing of the bad a ritualized performance of human agency, then the only people who are going to be able to enjoy that are going to be people who have embraced fascism as an ideology. But they're coping. And, it, and the people who actually carry it out are going to be the biggest psychos. And the ones who just root from the sidelines are going to be uh, the the biggest pussies, the most the most the soft ones, the ones who aren't mad about the system exploiting them, uh, and, and 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 are driving to punish people, and 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 and, and struggled upward in the hierarchy, but people who uh, have mostly enjoyed being middle class. So this liberal order that is predicated on liberal values is going to have to be overthrown to give, an, to give the last shred of active Amer human citizens, ones who are able to move towards power and affect change, ones who are in physical proximity and cultural proximity to power and can exercise it, are all going to move towards it. And that means that the formal system in the wire is going to move towards total authoritarianism. The only thing that could intervene and destroy fascism would be a fully technologized, technologized uh, uh, fascism, which would then allow for us to live in a fantasy world and maintain our liberal uh, uh, rituals and you know, continue battling with the threat of fascism forever. Like what that's going to be, like it's called neo feudalism, but that it implies a regression when it's more of a uh, of a negative dialectic. It's like you had this the feudalism. Feudalism was like. Uh, it was the old imperial model losing grasp. Uh, it was a recognition, like feudalism is just a recognition of the failure to be able to effectively uh, control a slave society. Like that's all it is. It's like, oh, the social, the social inputs that allow us to maintain order in a slave society have evaporated. And that means we need some other way to... Uh, extract surplus but that is less alienating and that is the the contract the bargain the consensual agreement that underlines feudalism
But then it, it came into final terminal crisis thanks to climate change. This is going to be basically the thesis of our 30 Years War show, is that climate change comes knocking in the form of the Little Ice Age. And it means that this, uh, this fatally undermined and, and decaying feudal system has to uh, respond with something else. And and reform and uh, and uh, re reestablish its basis, and that conflict is the third is the uh, the mass upheaval of the uh, the general crisis of the 17th century, out of which capitalism emerges in North in England and in uh, the Low Countries. And now, there is a, still a bunch of debate about what caused the Little Ice Age. Uh, uh, there's one interesting theory that says that... So, so one thing that definitely contributed to it one way or another is that not, this, is, this is how nothing is a fully closed system when, it, when you talk about this stuff, and there's always, you know, um, there's always chance to determining all of these otherwise overdetermined social relationships. Sometimes things just change because... And in and in uh, and in this case, you had in the uh, early 1600s, you had a massive decline in solar output. Uh, sunspots, which are explosions of uh, solar material outward, like uh, superabundances, uh, basically stopped around 1618, which I don't think totally coincidentally is the first year of the Thirty Years' War. So that happened, and that's nothing we had anything to do with. But at the same time, European interaction with the New World was causing death, human death on a scale basically unprecedented. Massive die-off, not really even because of uh, deprivations, although of course those were horrible, but because of disease. And what that led to was huge areas that had been uh, you know, filled with uh, CO2 producing human beings uh, just overnight almost were returned to nature and saw a huge efflorescence of, uh, of carbon sucking um, plant life emerge where that, those humans had previously been uh, exer uh, exhaling CO2. And that those things combined with a huge explosion in uh, volcanic activity which might have been caused by the sunspots, actually, interestingly enough, uh, but also happened simultaneously. It's this threefold cross rip that breaks up every system of mass power uh, practically around the world, except for places that had basically stored up rice for the winter uh, and had uh, been able to benefit from stability of resources long enough to like build really stable social structures like... Uh, Japan is really kind of the only big exception. And, of course, colonial North America. Uh, so one way or another, this changes the inputs once again. All the assumptions of feudalism were based on X amount of calories. They were no longer viable. How does a social order accommodate that? It has to build a new God. It has to create a new structure of values, a new story to tell itself about why things keep getting worse for some people because it's getting better for others. And the people it's getting better for can be told a story as to why it's getting better for them that they will believe because why wouldn't they? They have nothing else to compare it to. It's life. The only way you can be disabused of it is experience of at its bottom or the middle experience where you feel alienated and uh, assimilated to power and creates that nervous breakdown, that schizophrenia that, that is uh, a feature of like the capitalist mind. That kind of, uh, it's the breakdown of, of that, uh, that schizophrenia that, that pushes politics. And that's why it pushes it towards fascism. Uh, 
but I think that the thing that's going to determine how this plays out is going to be, uh, at this point, the, I guess, not, uh, I guess, just not really guessable fluctuations like like I, I just it feels so wrong to say that what could happen I, and that's why I really feel like if you ra if you if you stop trying to look like toward the future and accept how much of it is going to be determined by huge feedback loops like we're looking at coronavirus just like through sand and the gears in a way that like and uh, accelerated decline and centripetal uh, undermining of all systems you know it's it's like it's sugar in the gas tank of an already failing automobile Like, I don't think that, I don't think Putin invades Ukraine if the coronavirus doesn't happen. I'll say that. And you can't, who could predict the coronavirus? You can say generally, oh, there could, we will eventually get a disease. Yeah, of course. But how does that help me? So yeah, no predictions. I'm, I'm trying to, trying to keep to no prediction gang. So yeah, the political question then becomes a personal question. Like, what do you need to do in your life to maintain your sense of self, maintain your relationship to people around you? Like, I don't want to eat the bugs. I don't want to go with the um, cube thing. There is a, like... It's muted and mangled, but there is a, 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 a recognizable humane instinct there. Like what techno-fascism promises you is, yes, you can enjoy life in this declining empire, but you will observe the horrible, horrible despoilation and misery of a lot of people while it's happening. And because you have access to global information, you will be inundated with it. It, it cannot be refused. You know about it. How can you still stay in your position relative to it? How do you not resist it? If you feel like you are trying to change something. And so much of what allows comfortable middle class people to stay where they are is uh, the comforts of believing that they are uh, virtuous people. And public virtue for liberalism has to be racially blind because it, it, does, it, it does connect you to the world, which you need to have. And it, it has a belief in the other, which you need to have to have a politics at a global level. Because there has to be a stable political community. Like what the fascism is the is the seeking of a stable political community around one group dominating another, which of course could only then lead to it destroying itself. That's why it has to destroy itself. That's why it did destroy itself. Hitler didn't have to invade Russia. He invaded Russia because he was giving he was doing fucking uh, meth every day. The entire fucking country was gacked out of its mind.
But what it means to be a good person, uh, I mean, uh, the aggrieved middle doesn't have those values. Because the whole time that we have been building this edifice of capitalism, this alienated structure that doesn't really need human inputs to keep going, we've been building a cultural superstructure on top of it. And in that, there had to be a place for the aggrieved middle. And I would say that the aggrieved middle are the middle who uh, feel social alienation from the project of capitalism because they're not part of its story. It tells itself about itself. Or they're at proximity to violence. Because I would say that proximity to violence, even giving out violence, is a psychic toll. It is an alienation. I, I, I would argue that a... Uh, a slave owner on a plantation is vastly more alienated from the condition of uh, capitalism or social domination, what, feudalism, whatever, whatever you want to call it, than somebody who uh, passes bills back and forth in a uh, sitting room in Boston where nobody around him is enslaved. Nobody around him is getting whipped. That proximity to violence is a stressor that has to be released, and it's by identifying with the violence. And so those people still exist. They've still created a, a powerful social order that has been the engine of capitalism. It has been that thing that broke the tide of the working class, broke it in uh, the uh, 1870s by destroying Reconstruction, Broke it by uh, by <clears throat> building the the regime of uh, anti-immigrant fervor in the north and and uh, racism in the south to split the working class. It did it after World War One, the first Red Scare, and then it fatally did it away with it in uh, World War Two. What was what was the rise of fascism, if not the defeat of socialism in Germany? The elimination of the alternative through violent means. That set fascism on its death drive. It had to destroy itself then and there. As soon as it eliminated the alternative, it had to destroy itself. But in the West, socialism was not destroyed, not eliminated. Li the liberal social conception of secular virtue through egalitarianism could still exist as a horizon, as a thing that made everything okay, a thing that made our participation in this system virtuous. And that's why the slaves had, slavers had to be put down. But we couldn't let the working class win. No, 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 no. That's a no-no. Because remember, the top is there the whole time, asserting power independent of everybody else, the only truly self-conscious class. That's a huge, huge disadvantage. And I would say after World War II, like, it, the death starts in then, but the thing is, we didn't see the results because we won the war, and that means we got the spoils. And we got to distribute the spoils. And we got to live off of the spoils. But now the spoils are running out. After World War II ended, after the reactionary uh, segment of the Democratic Party took power with the uh, removal of FDR and, the, and his replacement with Harry Truman, after Stalin's capitulation to the West, 
his acceptance of a U.S.-led global market where the U.S. would get to determine things like reserve currency. And I got to say, Stalin taking that deal is a reflection of his thuggish narcissism. And not recognizing the moment for what it was, which was the fucking crucial moment. If we gave, if we gave the baton to the algorithm of, of profit driving Western liberalism and synthesize, having synthesized, in the process of synthesizing, fascism and distributing it throughout the whole structure, then what the hell were you doing it for? That's why it's unfair to blame Khrushchev for shifting to a consumer-based economy and liberalizing. He had to. Because this was going to be it. The moment of revolutionary project was over. We were going to be, a, the Soviet Union was going to be a state among states dedicated to maintaining its bureaucratic structure and the culture around that bureaucratic structure. Tell yourself stories about how you're fighting a revolution. Tell yourself stories about how you're the vanguard of the global working class, but really, at the end of the day, only caring about your dasha, the fact that you don't actually have to work in a fucking factory or in a fucking mine, the fact that you get a two-week vacation to the fucking Black Sea. It's an eventual uh, bureaucratic coup. And the same thing happened in China, but later. Because China started off way farther back. It had to develop more. There was basically, in many parts of China, during the early days of the, of the Chinese communist rule, there was basically no mode of production. You had these ancient like uh, trade structures that had existed for 2,000 years, and then uh, essentially non-existent uh, formal regime for extracting anything out of it. It took them much longer to develop that, uh, that bureaucratic uh, counterweight. The question is, because they built it in conditions of surplus, they built it in conditions of uh, Chinese relative advancement gave Chinese people a reason to think that the communists were doing the right thing. I think it means that in this case, the bureaucratic like hive of the CCP might very well have enough hooks to at least stave off final, uh, the final capitulation to the Borg. And maybe buying time is all they need to do, while everybody else who, who is being chewed up and spit out by it rallies and, 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 and tries to take it down from the outside, like the Sea Peoples. Like, think of us as the Sea Peoples. Or not us, that's very uh, smug, but... Anybody who realistically could uh, try to push this rotten edifice over from outside of it. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it's now theorized that the Sea Peoples, who, uh, whose interaction with the late Bronze Age helped accelerate, at the very least, its collapse, caused by climate change that it couldn't accommodate, by the way, were refugees fleeing from the site of uh, ecological devastation, the, 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 volcanic, the volcano zones uh, in the Mediterranean, and that they had come together as sort of ad hoc communities to, uh, to interact with the, those old late Bronze Age cities. And because those cities decided to uh, fight them, they, uh, they were destroyed. The, 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 the nemesis was brought to 
the annihilation of the thing. And, you know, you can look at that as the apocalypse, but how do we know that how things got distributed in the in the aftermath of that weren't better in the short term and the near term and the, in the medium term. Just because we don't see the continuation of the ritualized uh, the uh, ritualized um, like expenditure of surplus in the form of, you know, temples being built and, and things being built. That doesn't necessarily mean that, like, in conditions where things were declining anyway and people were going to have to find a new relationship to surplus no matter what, that given that condition, things were better and maybe gave left blueprints and left structures that later humans could try to, uh, try to enact. But yeah, the reason that we're all so neurotic and so depressed and so anxious is because we all recognize that we're not the protagonists, really, of this story. At the very least, we can uh, watch from the sidelines and maybe participate on the margins. The center of gravity here is people outside of the uh, comfort zone, where, even, where, where the distribution of pain in the social body is so disproportionately felt that uh, legitimacy cannot be maintained at the political level. And what they're going to do is going to determine how humanity uh, ends up. And all we can do as individuals in the West is look around us and act in accordance with our best feelings and, and let that be politics. And whatever that is, we can't know, and it could end up being incredibly important because of that goddamned butterfly effect and because of our relative proximity to power. Yes, we're far from power, but others are catastrophically farther from power. And the closer you are to power, the more coordinated activity can push against the flow. Okay. Ooh, this is a long one. So, yeah. That's why everything feels so weird, because nobody can imagine themselves in a place in the future, because we can't take for granted the conditions that we're going to be living in. And that doesn't even necessarily mean, like, we're going to see our own like lives change, but just our perception of the world around us, because these things all have resonances, you know, like they all ratchet up the frequencies. And that is, that is subjectively experienced, no matter how far you are from actual pain, because you're aware of it. Others are aware of it. The fact that they're aware of it Influ uh, influences their actions. It resonates out in sublimated ways, in, in, in uh, symbolic ways. And all we can really do is wonder, like, well, will I feel like I'm being squashed? Or will I feel like I am uh, in charge of my life? Because that's the only way that we can actually carry out virtuous ethical action, which we want to do, as I said. Because it's the most rational, emotionally satisfying thing. It's the thing that makes us less afraid. This is what I'm getting back to, is that, is that altruism is rational. Because putting yourself, putting as many people as possible between yourself and the sensation of fear is maximally hedonically and also evolutionarily advantageous. The fact that we don't think that that's true, the fact that we think there's a difference between those things, that facts don't care about your feelings, is down to us needing to reconcile 
the existence of a machine of exploitation and destruction that pulls us against our best interests is actually good, is to create an inverted reality. A shadow world on the cave for everybody to believe in. Everybody to believe in. There's no puppet masters. We're all invested with this ideology. The only difference between people at the top and the bottom is the people at the top are able to organize as a class more effectively. That's it. We're all acculturated to the same system of ethics. The same liberal notions of, of, of human worth and value. And ra which include rationality, because rationality is how we're supposed to get to the right action. Living rationally in an irrational world is the job of uh, culture, and it's the job of politics. It's, it's the filter that we run, it's the adapter, it's the dongle we use to connect these two worlds. And the, dream, the horizon of socialism is that you can, you can assimilate the humanist vision of liberalism and then re take it another step back to a common uh, project, a global project, where our interests, our rational self-interest, is a calculus that includes other people. Because a rational self-interest is a bunch of different things. And it weights other people relative to ourselves. And so a person's rational self-interest is not determined by their relationship to other people objectively. It's their subjective relationship to the people in question. I think I'm pretty far out into the galaxy brain right now, but I've, I, I, I'm still comfortable that this is all useful information for somebody. Hopefully somebody can get something out of this. I feel like it, it kind of makes sense. So the, the dream is that you can assimilate those things to a... To a social project that can effectively control the reins of power, that can control the inputs. And that means winning a war with capital over control of the technolo technology of capital. And in the for capital will be represented in battle by essentially uh, its assimilated human nodes. And we're all in the middle between these things. And we're being pulled in different directions. And only crisis will reveal to us through the imposition of necessity what our real values are. And I, I say that people whose values are all-encompassing or more encompassing than capitalisms have been can create together, as they have in places like Cuba, a alignment between a state project and a center of gravity of oppressed people within it. They can move the ship, push towards the distribution of pain equally through the system. That is, I think, the that's the goal. Even if this whole thing collapses, there will still be people, and if not people, sentient fucking octopus who walk on land, and there will still be the detritus of civilization that these people, or whatever the hell, or or uh, octopus, are going to sift through to try to reconstitute uh, social... It's going to keep happening, as long as the world exists. I mean, the thing is, Cuba's also got huge alienating factors. It's got a huge prison population. Obviously, nothing like ours but relative to other Latin American countries. Um, like, a lot of people want to leave because it sucks there. 
because there's part of a global capitalist structure. They're not allowed to distribute resources because they don't have them. But there is a path for working Cubans to feel like, now that not everybody feels that way, but there is a path. That path doesn't exist in America. That's why people create fantasies like QAnon. Like we're in a millenary death spiral because there is no outlet. There is no way to feel in charge of anything. And, and the fact that they're fucking, a, they were a oppressed colony. And somebody points out, that's an interesting element of China that we don't talk about enough, is that, yes, it's a nationalist project, but it's not a 19th century nationalist project like the ones that produced fascism. It was a 20th century nationalist project, which means it was forged in the context of anti-colonialism. So it is, and it's got in its DNA anti-colonialism, whereas 19th century nationalism was imperial. It was a, it was a struggle for resources and control by em, self-conscious empires. And in every case, it's all forced by violence. German nationalism was teased into being, modern German nationalism was teased into being by Napoleon's invasion. All these Germans who were living in this rat trap of a Holy Roman Empire just got their shit pushed in by this fucking sawed-off Frenchman. Why? Because the French had a national concept that they were willing to fight for. And so the Germans said, we got to get one of those. The French got theirs because the ruling regime had lost the mandate of heaven by failing to distribute enough uh, the pain efficiently. So it was overthrown by the active bourgeois, who then, of course, subscribed the nation because there was no uh, international working class movement yet to take the burden of that project, to, to reproduce it socially. All you had, you mostly had artisans. And artisans are middle class subjects. They are, uh, they're, the, they're the free peasant of the city, basically. And free peasants have a different class consciousness than worker, working class people. And that's why you couldn't get communism out of the French Revolution. You got nationalism, which then was weaponized to kick the shit out of the rest of Europe, but then created new nationalisms there. But crucially, that defeat by Germany was not felt as a colonial uh, violation. It was felt as great powers duking it out in Europe as they had been forever. China went from being the cradle of civilization, the longest tenured civilization on earth, equal in majesty and exceeding in majesty anything in the West for, for centuries, for millennia, gets, in the, in the blink of an eye, gets invaded and dominated by outside forces and exploited economically and, 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 and loses any uh, uh, like national um, uh, legitimacy. And the, the necessity then is, is inevitably uh, produced to create one. The century of humiliation. The first gasp of it was the Taiping Rebellion, when it had the mantle of an imported European concept, Christianity. And it almost toppled the Ming, and you could almost say it should have. And that, that's actually a very interesting hinge point is if, uh, the, the Ming if the Qing dynasty rather, sorry, was in fact overthrown by the Taipei Heavenly Kingdom, which came very close to happening. Uh, it was European intervention that tipped it back towards the king. Uh, it was 
at the end of the day, it was like the devil you know. There were Western advocates of the uh, Taipei Heavenly Kingdom because they're like, hey, these guys are Christian. We should ally with them. But that implied social leveling that the West didn't want. So the king hang on, and then, of course, they lose the middle class, which is when you get the nationalist uh, 1905 revolution of Sun Yat-sen. But then, you know, in those conditions, uh, that breaks apart almost immediately because you just don't have the structures to support this thing. Warlord era, then, of course, the Japanese invasion, another imperial outside interference. And you have a you have a, a, a protein communist party here, but it's it's sheltered in these small urban enclaves on the coast in a country that is overwhelmingly peasant. And it's those same peasants, it's those same dispossessed Hakka peasantry, the working class of the countryside, basically, the proletarians of the countryside who had formed the backbone of the Taiping Rebellion under the, under the uh, banner of Christ and, 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 the, and the equality promised by Christ, the heavenly kingdom of, of uh, redistribution, is now, the, by, the, by the 20th century, that uh, symbol is dead. Nobody believes that here anymore. What's left is Marxism, is socialism. And so that's what is picked up for the next stage of that rebellion. And this time it is successful, and it carries out the process of middle class, active middle class, not landed aristocrats, not the feudal order, the capitalized, either in the West capitalist, but in China, bureaucratic, and in Russia, bureaucratic, uh, the people who sit in offices and make phone calls. The important the nodes of interaction that actually have like a human variable involved. They modernize, and of course they kill a zillion people just like every modernization process does. Uh, and they built, and then Mao tried to, he saw what was coming. I don't think you can deny that. Sure, Mao wanted to keep power, but he also had a project in mind and he saw it coming apart. And that's why he hit the fucking panic button for the Cultural Revolution, stir up the kids and just hope that they could do something, like break down these uh, bureaucratic structures, these bourgeois value systems that had never been uh, broken up before, these uh, hierarchical relationships that had not been breaking up. Have these federal kids go in there and just go crazy, but you can't depend on students. You need people who actually work for a living. And those people had been annihilated by the uh, Great Leap Forward. And then what emerged was this compromise with capitalism after the Maoist push towards communism within capitalism failed. Which you could, always, you could just call a, a concession to reality. And that you've got to give Deng credit for being the clearest eyed of any of the communist leaders for seeing what was coming. Gorbachev, of course, being a complete doofus. The guy who should have... See, the real... Mm, God damn it. Mm, fuck. I might have to talk about this more on a different stream, but I kind of get the feeling like maybe there's one more hinge point after 1945 and like the consolidation of the Cold War where maybe things go significantly differently is if Nixon and Brezhnev in the 70s had really been able to bring China into a global system and then negotiate everybody's movement towards a globalized uh, corporate order a holistic system of systems. I'm not saying that would be good or would be uh, capitalism. Or I mean that it would be socialism. But it could have met the challenges of ch climate change 
earlier and more effectively, which would basically just buy us more time. I mean, my God, the way that Bruce, the, after Nixon gets, uh, gets murked, uh, Brezhnev's entire approach to uh, the obvious decline of the Soviet Union was, or and of the world system, was to just float by on high gas, uh, high oil prices. Because the very thing that was telling them all that they needed to fucking change the structure of this system to redistribute things, to make this less inefficient of a structure, to cut some of the fat. It was a short-term boom to the Soviet economy. And so for the people whose job it was just to stay in their office and keep their, keep their, their comfortable position, it was an easy call to just ride get oil prices until reality comes knocking in the form of the collapsing Afghan uh, government, and then boom. The same flails of a dying empire that we're going through. It's just, they're cyclical because there's nothing to oppose and, and transcend any of this. Yeah. I do wonder sometime about Nixon because he really was trying to, he was trying to assert a human agency over uh, this thing that had everyone by that point recognized had uh, defeated any alternatives to it. And of course it was racist and, and patriarchal and violent. Of course, it's Western capitalism. He's not a communist. But instead of communism being beaten and destroyed it's able to pos maintain its position as like a grounded material political economy that's able to assert influence and power in the world maybe the soviet union doesn't collapse maybe climate change can be addressed maybe we don't respond to the crisis of the 70s by cutting the throat of the working class. Who knows? Something to think about. All right. That's a long one. I hope it made sense. Bye-bye, guys.